Waves pounded on the hull, crashing into the stern doors. The sea and sky were a dark, blustery gray, with waves churning up the ocean and wind whipping across the deck. Mothers on board huddled together with their children, reassuring them everything was going to be all right. A small voice in the back of their minds whispered that it wouldn't, fear threatening to consume them. However, they feigned a brave face for the sake of their children. Nothing can stop a mother's love. Welcome to Shipwreck Sunday. My name is Eleanor. Just a quick disclaimer for a younger audience before we dive in. This story may be disturbing to some, so viewer discretion is advised. Okay, everyone, let's get into it. Roro ferries, though not as popular in the 50s as they are now, were still incredibly useful for those traveling for work or leisure and in need of taking their vehicle with them. MV Princess Victoria was no exception to this, being one of the earliest Ropax ferries. A Ropax ferry is simply a Roro ship with passenger capabilities. MV Princess Victoria was built sometime before 1946 for her owner, the British Transport Commission, being laid down as yard number 1399 in the William Denny and Brothers shipyard in Dumbarton, Scotland. Her first operator was London Midland and Scottish Railway, being the first purpose-built Roro ferry of her kind to operate in British coastal waters. She was the fourth ship named Princess Victoria, with her predecessor having been sunk during World War II in the Humber estuary by a German mine while on minesweeping duty. Externally, she looked a lot like this predecessor, though her loading methods were quite innovative. Before we get any further into her story, let's look at her specs. She was a Ropax ferry with her tonnage weighing in at 2,694 gross register tons. She was 309.75 feet long, had a beam of 48 feet wide, and a depth of 16.67 feet deep. As for capacity, she could carry 1,500 passengers with sleeping quarters for 54 people as well as 70 tons of cargo and 40 cars. For engines, she had two two-stroke single-acting Sulzer diesel engines, capable of reaching an average speed of 19 knots. She had two doors in the stern that were 5 feet and 7 inches tall, and this opened to allow cars in. With the doors closed, it acted as a bulwark, and not a perfect seal, between the ship's car deck and the sea. Because of issues with these doors in the past, a guillotine door was added as well to protect from sea spray. She was launched on August 27, 1946, passing her sea trials sometime after that and entering service in 1947. Her port of registry was Stranraer, Scotland, and her route was between Stranraer and Larne, Ireland. In 1948, her operator became British Railways Stranraer, and they would operate her up until the point of her sinking. Unfortunately, we do not have any information on her service history prior to the sinking, but we do have information on the weather in this area, which is important to note. In good weather, ferrying between Stranraer and Northern Ireland can be a pleasant, easy trip that takes roughly 2 hours and 15 minutes. It is a 31-mile trip and is pretty routine for many people. Unfortunately, the conditions at sea in this area can change dramatically and quickly. Ferry companies and their passengers nowadays benefit from the latest satellite technology that can provide ongoing forecasts. However, before there were satellites, the best forecasting information for vessels at sea came from the Met Office and BBC shipping forecast. On January 31, 1953, the forecast called for a deep depression to the northwest of Scotland that could bring gale force northwesterly winds right across the path of MV Princess Victoria, and she was due to make her regularly scheduled crossing at 7.45 a.m. that morning. The ship was on time leaving that morning, loaded with 44 tons of cargo and roughly 128 passengers. The sources vary because accurate passenger manifests were not required back then, and in bad weather, some passengers who had purchased tickets sometimes didn't show up. 55-year-old Captain James Ferguson had worked the crossing for 17 years, and this morning was nothing new to him. He was accompanied by 49 to 51 crew, though sources differ on this as well. She set out on time at 7.45 a.m. along Loch Ryan. Even with the perfect weather conditions, hugging the relatively sheltered Loch Ryan before heading out to open sea can be felt by passengers on the ferry, and this morning was no different. Though you can always expect something fresh and different here. 
If you're enjoying this video, leave me a like, subscribe to the channel for more content, and let me know down in the comments section below. Alright, time to continue with the final voyage. Unfortunately, the gale force winds that were expected were doubled when the original depression forecasted by meteorologists had deepened due to a smaller secondary depression on the southeastern edge of the storm. The ship struggled in the seas for 40 minutes longer than usual in Loch Ryan, and sea spray was breaking over the stern doors. Unfortunately, the protective guillotine door was damaged and unable to be lowered, leaving the two smaller doors to fend for the ship. Despite the difficult journey thus far, Captain Ferguson decided to put her out to sea. When leaving the lock, Princess Victoria was met with a full gale force storm that was already stirring up the sea into 30 foot tall waves. She was turned westward toward Larn as her bow dipped deep into a trough of a wave, tossing passengers and crew aside. The ship began listing to starboard, and at this point, Captain Ferguson decided to make a risky move turn the ship around and head back to the safety of Loch Ryan. This maneuver would first put the ship broadside and then stern on into the enormous waves. She corkscrewed into the trough of a wave and managed to turn around toward Loch Ryan, but huge waves slammed into the low stern doors, allowing water onto the car deck. The crew got back up on their feet and struggled in the heavy seas to close the doors once more. But unfortunately, the water was too powerful and they couldn't secure the doors. The scuppers, which is an opening in the wide walls of a vessel or an open air structure and allows water to drain, were not working because the deck was level and the scuppers were too small, and so the water was not draining out of the car deck, allowing flooding to worsen. Car decks of row row ferries can be incredibly dangerous because they are very open with little internal bulkheads, and this can evoke the free surface effect. This is a mechanism which can cause a watercraft to become unstable and capsize. Liquid hitting a wall inside the ship causes sloshing, and the sloshing can negatively affect a ship's equilibrium. We saw this in the case of MV Herald of Free Enterprise. Immediately, the concern was then turned to not allowing any more water from entering the stern. The ferry was tossed like a toy boat in the seas, facing the storm once more, and Captain Ferguson then attempted to go astern into Loch Ryan using the bow rudder. When the rudder couldn't be released, the vessel tried to maintain position off the entrance of Loch Ryan. At this time, life jackets were issued and the ferry's radio operator, David Broadfoot, used Morse code to signal for tug assistance at around 9.46 a.m., two hours after leaving Stranraer. The message to Port Patrick radio station read, quote, Hove to off mouth of Loch Ryan. Vessel not under command. Urgent assistance of tugs required. Cargo shifted in the hull, exacerbating the worsening starboard list, with water continuing to flood the car deck. At 10.32 a.m., a general SOS message was sent out, and at 2 p.m., Captain Ferguson called for passengers and crew to abandon ship as she rolled onto her beam ends. The whistle blasts blared above the roaring winds and seas as winds reached 120 miles per hour and flurries of sleet and snow reduced visibility to nothing. After 11 a.m., RNLI lifeboats were launched from Port Patrick and Donaghy, and the destroyer HMS Contest set out from Clyde to assist. HMS Launston Castle was en route to Derry and near the area, though she was forced to leave when her condensers were contaminated by salt. Her last reported position was five miles east of the Copeland Islands, just south of the entrance to Belfast Low. HMS Contest came close to this position around 1.30 p.m. However, the poor visibility prevented them from spotting Princess Victoria. Unfortunately, her engines were still pushing her in the sea, and the ferry was now five miles to the north of the reported position. This, the atrocious sea conditions, damage to search vessels, and the demands of numerous SOS calls in the area meant that Princess Victoria would sink before help arrived. To make matters worse, the horrific starboard list made the lifeboats on this side inaccessible, and so only lifeboats on the port side could be lowered into the water as the ship sank. As scared passengers started to carefully board lifeboats, their worst fears were realized. The free surface effect in the car deck was too much for Princess Victoria, and quickly she rolled, capsizing. Meanwhile, four merchant ships in the area that received her message were on their way. The cattle ship Lairdsmore, Trawler East Coats, Coastal Oil Tanker Pass of Drummokter, and Coastal Cargo Ship Orky. Orky would stumble upon the shipwreck, revealing her location finally. The ship had capsized sometime between 2 p.m. and 3.31 p.m. when an RAF Hastings that had been assisting rescues off Lewis and Barra arrived, and they dropped supplies and guided HMS Contest to the scene. 
The merchants were the first on the scene, and despite being there first, the water was too violent for them to deploy lifeboats. The Donaghy lifeboat Sir Samuel Kelly arrived and was able to rescue 33 survivors. This lifeboat has been preserved and is part of the collection at Ulster Folk and Transport Museum. The rest were rescued by HMS Contest. Of the 177 to 179 on board, there were only 44 survivors, all of them men, and none of them were the ship's captain or officers. The captain and officers went down with Princess Victoria, as well as the ship's radio operator David Broadfoot, who had kept contact from the radio room to allow crew and passengers to escape despite the fact that he was preventing his own, and was awarded a posthumous George Cross, which is on permanent display in Stranraer Museum. All of the women and children on board perished, and worst of all, eyewitnesses reported seeing a lifeboat with some of the women and children being smashed into the side of Princess Victoria in the enormous waves, killing them all. Among the dead were the MP for North Down, Sir Walter Smiles, and the Deputy Prime Minister of Northern Ireland, Maynard Sinclair. This great storm would result in 531 deaths, with MV Princess Victoria being the largest single loss of life, with 135 lost. Rest in peace to the victims of this disaster, and I hope the survivors have been able to reach a place of acceptance. This disaster was a shock to many because despite the fact the weather was extremely dangerous, it was a routine journey on a relatively short crossing in what was believed to be safe waters. The bodies of 100 people who died in the disaster were eventually recovered, with some coming ashore as far away as Isle of Man. Larn and Stranraer were small towns that largely relied on their seaports, and most families were affected in some way from the tragedy. A ceremony was hosted in Larn, with reeves tossed into the water and the crowd singing, quote, Lord, hear us when we cry to thee, for those in peril on the sea, which comes from the British hymn, Eternal Father, Strong to Save. A court of inquiry would follow the disaster, and this was held in March of 1953 at Crumlin Road Courthouse in Belfast, Ireland. Two main factors contributed to the loss of Princess Victoria. Firstly, the stern doors were not sufficiently strong, and secondly, arrangements for clearing water from the car deck were lacking. The car deck was level and not sloping to the ship's sides, and the scuppers were far too small to be effective. The report concluded that, quote, if the Princess Victoria had been as staunch as those who manned her, then all would have been well and the disaster averted. The court also noted for the record that a nearby destroyer, HMS Tenacious from the 3rd Training Squadron braced at Londonderry Port, was unable to make it out to sea due to the fact that too many men had been released on shore leave. After the inquiry, this would change. The duty on the destroyer from the 3rd Training Squadron was subsequently based, quote, on station at the mouth of Low Foil on one hour readiness to head out to sea. This is one consequence of the disaster. But there are no consequences to being a YouTube member or patron. This episode couldn't be possible without our amazing YouTube members and patrons. Thank you all so much. If you'd like to have some awesome perks like episodes a full day in advance, join our YouTube memberships today. Alright, let's look at the wreckage and similar incidents. The wreck was undiscovered for almost 40 years, finally being discovered in 1992. A team from Cromarty Firth Diving led by John McKenzie and funded by BBC was able to locate Princess Victoria's wreck utilizing data from a Royal Navy seabed survey that was performed in 1973. The wreck is 5 miles north-northeast of the Copeland Islands in 300 feet of water. In 1993, on the 40th anniversary of the sinking, video footage and stills from this expedition were shown on a BBC program called Home Truths. Things don't happen to boats like this. There are many notable incidents involving Roro ferries, including the capsizing of MV Princess of the Stars in 2008, the sinking of MS Estonia in 1994, the capsizing of MS Jan Hewlett's in 1993, and the capsizing of MS Herald of Free Enterprise in 1987. The thing all of these ships have in common is issues with the free surface effect and the inherent dangers of Roro ferries just purely from design. Roro ferries are very convenient, but vulnerable. The loss of MV Princess Victoria is particularly tragic, sending a pang of hurt right to the heart for the victims. They were left on edge in the storm for hours, hoping they'd make it and fearing they wouldn't. For most of them, their worst fears were realized that day. Rest in peace to the victims and survivors, and I hope they have all found peace. If you liked that story and wanted to hear something similar, check out our cruise ships, fairies, and Roro fairies playlist in the cards. 
Next week, we get into the story of MV Lejula, a Senegalese government-owned Roro ferry that capsized in 2002, leaving behind a massive death toll. Thank you for tuning in to Shipwreck Sunday, have a great week, and we'll see you next time.